on the far left. Dr. Finnin is the director of Ukrainian Studies Program at the University of Cambridge. His primary research interest is the interplay of literature and national identity in Ukraine. His broader interests include nationalism theory and human rights discourse. And Dr. Finnin will share a brief outline of Ukraine's history with the region, setting the current crisis in context. Dr. Finnin. Thank you, Paul. Can everyone hear me? Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for having me. Thanks to ADVA and to World Jew Jewish Relief. It's an honor to be here, and I must say I, I admire the work of World Jewish Relief, and uh, particularly like to thank all the supporters uh, for the great work you do, uh, particularly now. Now, uh, as Paul mentioned, I've been asked to give something of a brief overview of the history of Ukraine, which is impossible to do in 15 hours, much less 15 minutes. Um, Ukraine is simply too complex, too diverse, and too large. Uh, but it is none, <clears throat> nonetheless critical that one try right now, because Europe's greatest geopolitical crisis of the past decades is, one might say, an adventure and aggressive irredentism by the Kremlin leadership, uh, one apparently, at least from an ideological perspective, fueled by what I would say is a fundamental misapprehension of Ukraine, its peoples, and its history. Um, I would say as well that this misapprehension exists in Britain, um, even among some colleagues of mine. Uh, now let me start with uh, a comment that uh, Vladimir Putin uh, made yesterday in his very memorable speech. Quote, we are not merely close neighbors, here he's discussing uh, Ukrainians and Russians, but as I have said many times already, we Ukrainians and Russians are one people. Kyiv is the mother of Russian cities, ancient Rus is our common source and we cannot live without each other. There are a few things I'd like to say today. One of them is simply Ukrainians and Russians are, of course, not the same people. This effacement of difference, which is repeatedly advanced, as Putin himself observed, by the Kremlin, it's shared by a large percentage of the Russian populace, if we're to uh, trust some Levada center polling, and it's sometimes passively, uh, passively accepted here in Britain. Uh, this effacement of difference is ahistorical, I would say it's intellectually lazy, and right now it's very dangerous. Nor is the emergence of Ukraine as a multi-ethnic, multi-confessional, multinational state from the peripheries of empire some kind of accident, a folly of the great powers during the First World War. It is the result of a vibrant, I would say highly effective, and above all a civic national movement that defied geopolitical gravity. I really want to stress this uh, last point. Ukraine is the largest country within the continent of Europe, and it does not and cannot cohere, and could never cohere, uh, on the basis of ethnicity alone. It relied and relies upon a politics of individual, what we call individual self-ascription. One can become a Ukrainian. And this is very important for us to understand. Uh, I want to uh, show you a few maps today. Um, I may actually overwhelm you with some of them. I, I passed um, over to Richard uh, quite a few. Um, this is, of course, a map of Ukraine. Um, Crimea is still attached in, in this version. Um, but one, one thing I'd like to do is talk to you about what we see in the sources, first of all. Um, because what we, when we look at the sources, uh, Vladimir Putin's claim of an ancient intractable bond that's centered on Rus, Kievan Rus, um, which comprises roughly uh, northern Ukraine, the territory of Belarus, uh, some of western Russia, uh, this claim falls away almost immediately when we look at the sources. Uh, up until the late 16th century, most Muscovites were rather ignorant of and indifferent to the peoples populating the lands of today's Ukraine. They were certainly not influenced by the idea of any kind of East Slavic unity, of being one people, as Putin would put it. This notion of East Slavic unity really only catches on later. Uh, in the era of Peter the Great, uh, and it comes actually through uh, Ukrainians who emigrate from Kyiv uh, to uh, Russian lands um, to advance some of Peter the Great's ecclesiastical reforms. I'm thinking most prominently here of Teofan Prokopovich, um, who introduces this idea of an East Slavic unity and a descendancy from Rus. I want to show you some maps um, from the 17th and 18th centuries to show you how consistent the borders of Ukraine have been conceived, not only by um, Ukrainians themselves in their own history, but also by uh, foreign observers and foreign cartographers. Um, here's one that is actually somewhat disorienting because it runs, instead of 
uh, up and down north to south. It's, in fact, flipped on its head. So uh, below here we have the, uh, the north, and up above uh, the south you can see the Black Sea. But here again, if you look towards the bottom right-hand corner, uh, you can see Ukraine and the name Ukraine clearly given to this territory. This is a later map of the 18th century. Also, very clearly, one can see, because with this color coding that's actually contemporary to the map itself, um, something along the lines of uh, contemporary borders of Ukraine. Now, <clears throat> going back to this issue of one people, before 1648, nearly all Ukrainians lived within the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, whose eastern frontier extended to the east of Dnipro or the Dnieper River. Only after 1667 did uh, part of that vast territory, uh, today's regions of Poltava and Chernihiv, over there to the east and north, uh, became, uh, under, well, fell under the rule, uh, I would say, let's say formal, but let's say not quite practical rule of the Tsar in Moscow. Even after 1667, it's important for us to understand that Warsaw ruled more Ukrainian territory and more Ukrainians than Moscow did. The land to the west of the Dnipro, uh, often referred to as white, uh, right bank Ukraine, Pravo Borezhna Ukraina, remained with the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth until the partitions of Poland in the late 18th century. The Polish nobility, it's important to note, was the dominant group in this area well through the 19th century and up until, I would say, the revolutions in 1917. As for Eastern Galicia, uh, the s areas around Lviv, Lemberg, uh, Lvov, Lyapolis, Ternopol, Ivano-Frankivsk, all of these were annexed by uh, Habsburg Austria in 1772 and remained uh, part of Austria until uh, roughly 1918. This uh, region experienced a brief spell of independence as the West uh, Ukraine, Ukrainian People's Republic uh, until it fell in uh, 1919 under the rule of a new Poland, becoming Soviet when Poland was invaded by uh, both the Soviet and Nazi forces. And after Hitler's invasion of the Soviet Union, uh, Galicia or Halicina came under German occupation and then returned to the Soviet Union in 1914. As for the region of Zarkarpatia or Transcarpathia, it was a part of Hungary uh, without interruption from the Middle Ages to 1919 when it was annexed to the new Czechoslovakia where it existed for about 20 years. It became Hungarian again uh, from 1939 to 1944. And only after that date, 1944, was it ruled from Moscow. The area of Bukovina has a similar story. Uh, it was part of the Romanian political space from 1918 to 1940 and became Soviet only in 1940, formally incorporated into the Soviet Union in 44. We all know about Crimea, uh, annexed by Catherine II in 1783, formerly the Crimean Tatar Khanate, very loosely affiliated with uh, Ottoman political space. My point is not to offer you a, a dry geopolitical and geographical lesson, but it's rather to impart an important truth. Um, that we occasionally uh, reduce or read over, and that is that Ukraine simply cannot be viewed um, as exclusively part of Russian or Soviet space. Uh, Ukraine is a country intimately uh, linked to not only Russia, but also the countries of Central Europe and the Black Sea region. So how did uh, this country emerge? How did it defy, as I would say, geopolitical gravity uh, and not succumb to these various links? I mean, one need only look at the size of Ukraine to wonder how, in fact, it emerged as it did um, as a state uh, in the 20th century. I want to point out, this is also from some 17th century maps um, by Guillaume Boplan, who was one of the first cartographers of Ukraine. Uh, you can see this area that is now roughly the Donbass, uh, called a loca deserta, uh, that is a wild field. Um, you can also see it uh, just above Crimea as well. This uh, shows you, again, um, the progress of the uh, Ukrainian lands in history after uh, the uh, Khmelnytsky rebellions, which of course were traumatic for the Jewish communities in the Ukrainian lands uh, at, at this point, and here to the 20th century. Uh, again, notice the borders, very con continent uh, with uh, the borders of contemporary Ukraine after 1991. Uh, this is a map of the Ukrainian People's Republic 
which emerged in 1917. It was a highly uh, progressive state for its time. Uh, this is also a map, uh, but from a, a French cartographer of the same uh, People's Republic, the Narodna Respublica. The People's Republic uh, was remarkable for a number of reasons. Um, and this is to tie back to my comment again about the Ukrainian national movement being very much civic oriented. It had to be civic oriented. It had to recruit constituencies that were not simply ethnic Ukrainian uh, for the uh, political venture to be successful. This is the back of a hundred uh, karbovanets, um, bit of currency from the period of the uh, Ukrainian People's Republic. Notice the languages uh, on it includes Polish, uh, Russian and Yiddish. I think it's the, the first uh, uh, use of Yiddish on a currency in world history, if I'm not mistaken. Now, um, Ukraine emerges uh, as a state in the, in the 20th century because uh, of a very simple idea, uh, a simple idea propounded in the poetry of Taras Shevchenko, whose bicentennial, in fact, we're uh, marking this year. Shevchenko's verse is important for us to understand uh, because it gives the most powerful, most vivid articulation to the Ukrainian national idea that, again, is not ethnic. Uh, Shevchenko is not someone who talks about ethnic inheritance. He doesn't trace genealogy. He really puts forward a number of ideas about justice, particularly uh, a justice between um, oppressed peoples. He advances something of a transnational solidarity with a subaltern, we might say. Uh, this is a powerfully effective and influential idea um, throughout this territory. Um, so <clears throat> the national project itself, as a political phenomenon, gained steam in uh, the period of revolution in 1917. This is why, uh, when the Soviet Union is founded, uh, and established, there is such a thing as the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. Lenin and Stalin were very aware of the power of uh, national identities and national ideas. In fact, Lenin was quoted as saying, uh, great Russians are often uh, mistaken in not appreciating um, the strength of the Ukrainian national idea. And if one does not appreciate it, uh, they'll be sorely uh, mistaken for it. Um, so this was something he, he upheld and believed hence the emergence of a Soviet Republic with the modifier Ukraine. Um, in 1991, with the dissolution of Soviet Union, independent Ukraine is often regarded by Western scholars as a so-called cleft country, a divided country. This is a thesis advanced by Samuel Huntington in a very influential book, The, Class, the Clash of Civilizations. Um, <clears throat> this map is seen on Sky News, or a version of it is seen on Sky News, BBC, Al Jazeera. Uh, it changes quite often. Uh, the border of this division is always flipping on television, uh, particularly over the past few uh, weeks and months. Um, but this is a very powerful trope and a powerful idea that Ukraine is somehow divided between a pro-EU West and a pro-Russian East. In fact, that is a refrain of almost every journalistic article about Ukraine since 1991. Uh, I want to impart to you that it is very mistaken and highly reductive. Notice, notice the way in which Ukraine is constantly represented as ontologically dependent on others. We don't even speak of Belgium in this way. Um, it's, it's diverse, uh, its national identity is contested, but not weak. And it's very important for us to understand this right now with this prospect of an impending invasion based on this idea that the East and the South is somehow pro-Russian. We have to take on board their Ukrainian identity is also uh, very powerful as well. Let me give you a few examples very quickly because I'd like to, uh, of course, make time for uh, further discussion. Uh, a different type of map uh, that gives us some sense of a lack of division among uh, a lot of sectors of Ukrainian society. This is a map drawn from data from the 2001 census. Uh, it's likely, in fact, changed quite a bit. I would say the red you see in this map has grown and uh, I think developed and moved a little bit further to the east and south. But essentially what it shows you um, are respondents who identified as their Rydnamova, native language, Ukrainian or Russian or Hungarian or Romanian, what have you. But you'll notice um, that that identification of the native language as Ukrainian extends well into the east and south of the country. Um, does it mean, however, that Ukrainian is spoken in the home? It doesn't mean it's even spoken on the street. Russian is very much the lingua franca of the south and east. Um, and the e interests of the Russian-speaking population needs to be really valued and respected. But it goes to this issue of one's identity. And if we don't understand that in the Soviet period, identity was very fluid, is often contested in political discourse, um, 
now after 1991, it's very difficult for people to establish a very clear sense of one's identity. Um, but this type of map and this type of response to a question about one's native tongue shows us that in fact a division doesn't exist in the way we often think it does here in the West. Uh, I think that is uh, the end of my uh, slide presentation. Thanks for bearing with me through all those maps. Uh, I look forward to your questions.